Space may be humanity's final frontier, but our desire to conquest what's out there has inspired some rather bizarre projects. Some of these more left-of-field space projects have included the use of nuclear arms. Here, then, are five examples of those nuclear-inspired space projects. Nuking the moon. It's true. Both America and the USSR have had plans to nuke the moon. It's well known that being the first to the moon was the top priority for the two superpowers. And one way both countries thought would best prove that they'd been to the moon was simple. Nuke it. In 1958, the U.S.'s Armor Research Foundation, or ARF, developed a plan designated as Project A-119, or a study of lunar research flights. The ARF developed the plan with guidance from the Air Force. Between 1949 and 1962, the ARF studied the possible effects of a nuclear detonation on the lunar surface. The director of the project, Leonard Reifel, would later write, quote, it was clear the main aim of the proposed detonation was a PR exercise and a show of one-upmanship. The Air Force wanted a mushroom cloud so large it would be visible on Earth. The nuclear explosion on the moon would also provide invaluable data to scientists and the military about the effectiveness of nuclear weapons in space, as well as detection of nuclear device testing in space. Project A-119, which remains classified, was unwittingly revealed by famous cosmologist Carl Sagan, in 1959, Sagan's application for a scholarship divulged some of the work he had done for the ARF, including reports he'd written titled, quote, Possible Contribution of Lunar Nuclear Weapons Detonations to the Solution of Some Problems in Planetary Astronomy and Radiological Contamination of the Moon by Nuclear Weapons Detonations. Sagan's application caused a sensation when it was discovered by biographers after his death in 1996. The Pentagon has never commented on the old Cold War project to nuke the moon. It's believed many of the reports from that time have since been destroyed. Former Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara discussed how his own military advisors warned him in the 1960s that the Soviets would try to circumvent the limited test ban treaty by testing nuclear arms behind the moon. He thought his advisors were out of their minds. They were dead serious. McNamara divulged this in the Academy Award-winning 2003 documentary The Fog of War. Two Russian scientists, Sergei Karolev and Mstislav Keldish, proposed a series of projects in 1958 that would take the Soviets all the way to the moon. They proposed that the last part of the E project, as it was called, would be the detonation of a small nuclear charge on the lunar surface. Then no one on Earth would doubt the Soviets had reached the moon. The idea was rejected only because physicists decided that the flash would be so short that it might not register on film. Nuclear engines. The problem with space exploration is the sheer size and scale of the known universe. The American physicist Freeman Dyson would relate how he and a handful of other physicists were recruited by General Atomic in the late 1950s to develop a unique kind of spaceship propulsion. The goal was to speed up space travel. It was in 1946 that Polish-American scientist Stanislaw Ulam came up with the idea of using nuclear bombs for propulsion. The idea was simple enough. Drop a series of atomic bombs behind a spaceship and ride the momentum from the blast. It was called nuclear pulse propulsion. Dyson would state how there would be about four bombs per second, in one wave after another. The payload section, which carried the astronauts and module, would be at the top of the spaceship. The nuclear bombs would drop from the opposite, so-called pusher, end. It was called Project Orion, and it lasted between 1958 and 1965. At the same time, a more traditional chemical rocket propulsion system was being developed by NASA for its Apollo moon program. Dropping a trail of nuclear bombs was surely why Project Orion failed. It quickly lost public and political support because of the dangers of nuclear fallout that would come from dropping that many bombs in quick succession. Yet the physicists who worked on the project were convinced that the bomb would work as an extremely powerful propellant system. The Orion team had set their sights on Mars, and then Jupiter, and beyond. It was even believed that nuclear pulse propulsion could ultimately be used for interstellar travel. They believed it would be the perfect propulsion system for fast and cheap interplanetary travel. As for radioactive fallout, it was thought that chemical rockets could be used to boost Orion to above the atmosphere. 
However, estimates were that around 10 people would still die from the radiation per flight. Thankfully, General Atomic never got permission to do propulsive testing with actual nuclear bombs. Nuking space. The space race and the nuclear race between the superpowers were in top gear by 1962. In the summer of that year, the US upped the ante on both races by blowing up a hydrogen bomb in outer space, some 250 miles above the Pacific Ocean. It was essentially a weapons test, but one that created a man-made light show that has never been equaled. It was codenamed Starfish Prime. The genesis of that hydrogen bomb in space was the findings of space scientist James Van Allen. He discovered that the Earth is surrounded by belts of high-energy particles, comprised mainly of protons and electrons, that were held in place by the planet's magnetic fields. The upper and lower radiation belts around Earth are called Van Allen belts, and Van Allen agreed with the military that efforts should be made to disrupt the radiation belts. But how to do that? By setting off atomic bombs in the magnetosphere to see the effect of the belts. The bizarre purpose of these tests was supposedly to see if the Van Allen belts could move a blast from space down to an earthly target, and even if a human-made explosion might alter the natural shape of the radiation belts. It can only be assumed that such a project was the result of the ongoing Cold War paranoia of the time, which for the Americans meant, if we don't do it, the Russians will. And the Soviet Union was indeed testing atomic and hydrogen bombs in space. It had already been found that atomic bombs had little effect on the Earth's magnetosphere. However, Starfish Prime packed another punch. The hydrogen bomb explosion that detonated 200 miles above the Johnston Atoll in the northern Pacific Ocean on January 9, 1962, was immense. That bomb had an explosive yield of 1.45 megatons, which was approximately 100 times that of the Hiroshima bomb. The force of the bomb literally created an artificial extension of the Van Allen belts. It could be seen in the form of an artificial aurora borealis right across the Pacific Ocean, from Hawaii to New Zealand. Just three months after Starfish Prime, the world found itself at the brink of nuclear war during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and only later would the crucial role of the magnetosphere in shielding life from solar winds be fully understood. Nuking an Asteroid Earth has been hit by asteroids with regularity for the last 4.6 billion years. A six-mile-wide asteroid was blamed for the end of the dinosaur era 66 million years ago. The problem with asteroids is that their orbits can be irregular and easily changed by the gravitational pull of passing planets. Just to be safe, government scientists have officially designated a spacecraft to hit any large oncoming asteroids with a nuclear explosion. It's called the Hypervelocity Asteroid Mitigation Mission for Emergency Response, or HAMMER, spacecraft, and is a collaboration between the National Nuclear Security Administration, NASA, and two Energy Department weapons labs. Hammer would either steer its 8.8-ton bulk, called an impactor, into a small asteroid, or carry a nuclear device to deflect a larger one. Physicist David Dearborn of the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory is of the opinion that if the asteroid is small enough, and is detected early enough, that it can be deflected with the impactor. A method for impacting an asteroid will be tested for the first time during the Double Asteroid Redirection Test a NASA mission scheduled to launch in June 2021 and collide with an asteroid's moon in October 2022. However, the nuclear option remains the best option for larger asteroids more than 0.6 miles or so in diameter. There would be no need for the nuclear explosion to actually touch the asteroid directly. Rather, the trick is to set off the explosion a few hundred feet above. The irradiated surface of the asteroid would heat up dramatically and then that exposed surface would blow off from the asteroid. That dramatic action would trigger an equal and opposite reaction, causing the asteroid to rebound away, thereby averting its catastrophic trajectory with Earth. Ultimately, any method to take on an asteroid is about adjusting the asteroid's orbital speed so that its path no longer intersects with our own. All that may be needed is changing the asteroid's speed by a little more than an inch or so per second. Nuking Mars Transforming Mars from an uninhabitable planet to one that more resembles Earth is what's called terraformation. A concept that was the heady domain of sci-fi authors has become seriously considered by scientists in recent decades. One popular scheme involves unleashing nuclear warheads over the poles, thereby unlocking billions of tons of frozen carbon dioxide 
and triggering a runaway greenhouse effect on the red planet. It may be considered crazy, but some scientists believe it's possible. Elon Musk, the irreverent CEO of SpaceX and Tesla, is a firm supporter of the Martian nuclear poles theory. Mars today is a frozen, bleak desert, but ancient riverbeds hint at a much warmer, more humid past. However, models that rely on greenhouse gases alone have trouble producing stable, long-term warm climates on Mars. It's believed that a layer of high-altitude clouds may have helped the planet be warmer and wetter billions of years ago. So could cloud seeding be a viable terraformation strategy for Mars? Chris McKay, an astrobiologist at NASA who has led the scientific discussion on Martian terraforming since the 1990s, believes high-altitude clouds such as cirrus clouds could be the answer. He does think that nuking the icy poles of Mars could possibly trigger runaway greenhouse gases to warm the planet, but contends that many bombs would be needed, resulting in very high levels of radiation on Mars. The hope for most scientists must surely be that the winning combination of terraformation on Mars will one day be achieved with many clouds and not many bombs. <laughs>